Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm Cantor David Prozer from Kimsville Conservative Synagogue, Kehilat Bet Hamidrash. And we're discussing this week's Parsha for Shabbat of April 3rd and 4th, Saturday being the 10th of Nisan, 5780. The Parsha is Parshat Sav in our regular cycle of weekly Torah readings. And it's also Shabbat Hagodol, the last Shabbat before Pesach. We thank Dr. Isma Shursh, Rabbi Joseph Prouser, Rabbi Irvin Prize, Rabbi Becky Silverstein, and Rabbi Cheryl Peretz for their various teachings and publications on this week's Parsha. This week's Parsha, Tzav, opens with the divine commandment of the burnt offering, which leads to the command that a flame be kept burning on the altar in perpetuity. Parsha Tzav goes on to take the form of a manual for the priesthood. It includes a more comprehensive and detailed review of the sacrifices that were introduced last week in Parshat Vayikra and describes the expansion of ritual observance beyond the priesthood, specifically empowering the Israelite nation with the rudiments of the dietary laws that will be expanded upon later in the Torah. As we described last week in Rabbi Hertz's commentary on animal sacrifice being the basis of worship of many ancient cultures, we concede that Vayikra's opening chapters sound foreign to modern ears. But we need to look deeper into the differences between the Jewish concept of sacrifice and the image of pagan rituals that we might imagine. Let's start with the fact that the English word sacrifice is not a very good translation of the Hebrew word karbon. Sacrifice brings to mind the image of ancient pagans killing animals or even humans to satisfy the hunger of their gods for food and blood. A karbon was quite different. With the exception of the ola, the burnt offering, all of the edible meat of the animal was eaten by the Kohanim, the priests, and the offerer and his family. The word karban has a root meaning to draw near. The bringing of the offering was an attempt to draw closer to the divine. In other words, God didn't need the smoke of dead animals but we needed to experience a way to draw closer to God. The noted Torah commentator Rashi asks why it was necessary to command the performance of the burnt offering. The second pasuk of the Parsha reads, Tzav et Aharon viet benov, command Aaron and his sons. Rashi then answers that unlike other offerings that were shared with the priests and the offerer, the burnt offering was totally consumed on the altar. Therefore, the priests gained no benefit from its offering. So perhaps they would be lax about its performance. Therefore, God phrased it as a command in order to impress upon the priests the great obligation to perform this ritual. The Parsha continues with more laws about burnt offerings, daily meal offerings, laws of the expiatory sin and guilt offerings, as well as offerings of well-being and of thanksgiving. And no, in those days, it was not a turkey. Expanding ritual responsibility from the priesthood to the general populace, all Israelites are forbidden from eating the fat or blood even of permitted animals. Again, emphasizing the sacred role of the people Israel as a whole, at God's command, Moshe gathers the entire community of Israel at the entrance to the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting. In this manner, Aaron and his sons will be aware that they are serving on behalf of the people, and the people will be aware that the consecration has been done at divine command. 
Moshe washed Aharon and his sons and dressed them in the prescribed priestly vestments. The Mishkan and all of its accoutrements are anointed with sacred oil, further initiating the regimen of sacrificial worship. The altar is sanctified with a bullock and rams, and the ordination of the Kohanim, the priests, including Aharon, the high priest, is signified by the sacrificial blood put on their ears, thumbs, and toes. Through this dramatic ritual, each priest is purified and dedicated his entire being to his sacred endeavor, as well as acknowledge the importance of the human role in the divine service. The newly ordained founding priests of Israel are consecrated by the sacrificial blood and sacred oil sprinkled on them, as well as the altar at which they will serve God and his chosen people. The consecration service shows that ordinary materials and ordinary people can be transformed into clay kodesh, instruments for serving God. The installation of Israel's priestly leaders culminates in a week-long process. You shall remain at the entrance to the tent of meeting day and night for seven days, keeping the Lord's charge that you may not die. For so I have commanded, as chapter 8, Pesach 35 states. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, this week is another of the special Shabbatot that precede Pesach. This Shabbat is Shabbat Hagodol, the last Shabbat before Pesach. Why is it called Shabbat Hagodol? Usually, we would find three reasons that explain any Jewish observance. Number one, it's commanded in the Torah. Number two, historically, such and such was happening back in biblical times, and the rabbis bridged that into the Torah command to explain what we're doing and why we were doing it. And number three, Bubby did it this way. Unfortunately, we can't use those same three parameters to explain Shabbat Hagodol, at least not directly, because as far as number one is concerned, there is no additional Torah reading on this Shabbat, although we are going to reference the special Haftorah read on this day. For number two and number three, we're going to get there, but in a roundabout way. Even Rashi, the dean of Torah commentary, explains that even in his time, people are accustomed to calling the Shabbat before Pesach Shabbat Hagodol, meaning the great Shabbat. But they do not know what makes this Shabbat greater than any other. So like Rashi, different commentators speak of it and try to explain its origins. In many commentaries, Shabbat HaGadol finds its origins, as does any other special Shabbat, like Shabbat Nachamu, Shabbat Chazon, Shabbat Shuvah, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, namely through the word association joining the theme of the related event with a quote from the Haftorah. In this case, the last verse of this special Haftorah from the book of the prophet Malachi refers to a day in the future which will be Godol, great. Hine onochi sholeach lochem. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. From the book of Malachi 3.23. Now, that sort of covers number one, even though it's actually Haftorah and not directly from the Torah. So now let's look at number two, history. The Torah, Rabbi Jacob ben Asher from the 13th century, writes that the Shabbat before Pesach is called Shabbat Hagodol because a great miracle was performed for Israel just before redemption from Egyptian slavery. At God's command, 
on the 10th of Nisan, each family took a lamb, a symbol that was associated with a god of Egypt, and tied it to their doorposts and kept it there for four days. They told the Egyptians that they would slaughter it on the 14th of Nisan, thus assuring that the Israelites would be spared from the destruction of the final plague. The day they took that lamb was a Shabbat that year. The fact that they were able to keep the lamb out in public and unmolested from the Egyptians was the miracle. As a commemoration of that miracle, every year, the last Shabbat before Pesach is designated Shabbat Hagodol. And finally, let's look at number three. Bubby did it this way. Well, actually, it's not specifically the Bubbies of our generation. But we might imagine in the shuttle period of our history, before a formal sermon became part of the weekly service, Shabbat HaGodol became known as one of two Shabbatot on which the rabbi would deliver an extensive sermon, the other being Shabbat Shuba between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It would usually keep people in shul involved in learning until the late afternoon in order to hear the teaching expounding the laws of removing leaven and preparing for Pesach. Due to the length of time in shul, it became known as Shabbat Hagodol, the big Shabbat. So again, with a little stretching, we can apply the same three reasons why we do most of what we do. From my colleague, Rabbi Penitz, and our joint KBH and Temple Israel families, a meaningful Shabbat Shalom, a Guten Shabbos, and our best wishes for a Zissan Pesach, even though this year we may have to do it in some very unique ways. In addition to Manishtana Halayla Hazeh, why is this night different? We will surely be thinking Manishtana Hashana Hazeh, why is this year different? And in addition to L'Shana Haba Birushalayim at the end of the Seder, we can surely pray for L'Shana Haba with all of our family and friends back at the Seder table, all together again in the same place at the same time. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This is Rabbi Michael Panitz. I'm not speaking to you from the pulpit of Temple Israel, as I had done for the last two Shabbatot, because Governor Northam has advised us that we need to stay indoors. So I'm speaking to you from our family home, and I want to show you one Jewish item before proceeding. This is called a Mizrach, because the word Mizrach means east. East is where Jerusalem is for us in the Western world. And this particular Mizrach has the species associated with the land of Israel, the wheat, the barley, the olive, the grape, the fig, the date, the pomegranate. It's good to keep Israel in mind at a time such as this. That particular Mizrach was purchased at a wonderful place, and I recommend that institution for your charitable concern. It's called Yad La Kashish, Lifeline for the Elderly. It's a sheltered workshop for elderly residents of Israel, some of whom were falling through the cracks of the social service network. They learn how to produce very fine crafts and arts, and those are sold, and it's beautiful beautiful adornments for home and for gift. Now, turning to today's message, which will be recorded in two segments. We're getting ready for Passover at a most unusual time. This is the Passover of the plague year. In that way, it's like the very first Passover, which was a Passover in the midst of a plague year. So remember the scene, the very first Pesach ever. The children of Israel sheltering in place 
huddled in their homes while the plague passed all around them, hopefully skipping over their homes. That's what the word Pesach means, passing over their homes. It feels all too relevant. I'm sure that the Israelites back then weren't completely hopeful. They had not yet been freed. They had never not been slaves. How were they to know that Pharaoh wouldn't kill them at the last moment, the way that Nazis killed concentration camp inmates, even at the last moment before the American and the British and the Soviet Red Army liberated them? How could they know? So the mixture of hope and fear that must have animated those first Jewish celebrants of the Passover feels very close to us today. I want to talk to you about what to do about this sense of helplessness. And my point is simply that the rabbis long ago have showed us the way. Let's consider what Pesach was like for the rabbis who gave us the Haggadah. It must have been such a challenge because Pesach is a feast of freedom. It's the July 4th of the Jewish people. It's the anniversary of when we became an independent nation. But what was the reality of Jewish life at the time of the rabbis? Were we independent? No, we had not been independent ever since the Roman proconsul Pompey first put his sandaled foot on the soil of Eretz Yisrael. We were a province or a sub-province of Rome. We'd even lost the status of having our own Jewish client king. And we were governed or misgoverned by very cruel and exceedingly rapacious uh, procurators. We were not free. And when we tried to go free, our temple was destroyed. And when we tried again to go free under Bar Kokhba, we were slaughtered by the untold thousands. We were not free. How could we celebrate Pesach at a time of unfreedom? What would Pesach mean in an era when we were still subjugated to Rome? That's the question that the rabbis had to answer. They answered for themselves, and as I will show you, they answered for us as well. The child asks the questions, how is this night so different from other night? Why is that? And the leader of the Seder answers, Avadim Hayinu, we were slaves. But then the leader makes another assertion. Ve'ilu lo hotzianu hakadosh baruch hu, if God the Holy One had not taken us out of Egypt, hare anu uvanenu uvane banenu mishu abadim hayinu lefaro v'mitzrayim, we and our children and our children's children would still be enslaved to Pharaoh of Egypt. What does that answer mean in the terms of what the rabbis are trying to say? By the way, that's not in the Bible. Nowhere does it say in the Bible that if God hadn't taken us out at one minute, God might not have taken us out at another minute. That's a rabbinic add-on. What they're trying to say is that the Exodus makes a difference forever. It happened once, life is never the same. Even if today we are not as free as we want to be, the Exodus is still important. It launched us as a people. Today we're facing challenges, but we're facing challenges as an independent people, as the people of Israel. So the first part of the answer is that yes, the Romans are ruling us now, but it's not as bad as it was under Pharaoh because we have all that has strengthened us up to this point. Then there's a second answer. The leader takes a cup of wine in hand. Everyone lifts their cup of wine, but we don't drink this time. This is just a toast to God. And this is what we say. This has held, this has stood both for our ancestors and for us. 
שלא אחד בלבד, אלא שבכל דור ודור עומדים עלינו לכלותינו. Not just once, every single time, every generation, someone rises up, someone wants to exterminate us. והקדוש ברוך הוא מצילנו מאדם. But the Holy Blessed One saves us from their hand. A remarkable assertion. Think about it. It's July 4th, and someone raises a pint of good Milwaukee suds, and you'd expect them to toast George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Instead, it's July 4th, and they say, not just 1776, but 1865, and 1918, and 1945, and they go on and on and on like that. It's not exactly what you expect on July 4th. So what the rabbis say at the Seder is not exactly what you expect. It happens all the time. Why are they saying that? They're saying that because they want us to understand that Passover is not just antiquarian. Passover is about right now. Passover is about all the time. Passover is our way of affirming that God is with us in tough times. And God is with you and with me in this tough time. And then there's the third part of the rabbi's answer. And this is at the very end of the magi, the narrative, just before we drink the second cup of wine. The rabbis say, Kain Adonai Eloheinu velohe avotenu hagienu lemoadim velirgalim acherim habaim likratenu lishalom. O God, we pray that just as you rescued us once before, you will again rescue us and bring us in the future to celebrate our holidays fully. And that, for this year, might be the most important single phrase in the whole Haggadah. You did great things for us in the past, and we pray that you will do great things for us in the future. Today, we are celebrating Passover somewhere between Egypt and the desert and the Promised Land. We're not exactly in the Promised Land today, but we have all the blessings that have sustained us, and we will go forward. Lishana haba'a Birushalayim. Next year, a more perfected Passover to each of us. Shalom.